Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. I'm just going to pray real quick and we're going to dive in. Thank you, Lord, for today, what you have prepared for us, what you have prepared for this day. Lord, thank you for everything that you are, everything you've done for us, giving us an opportunity to give back to you. Lord, today as the word is is spoken, Lord, I ask that our hearts would be open to receive what it is that you would say to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, so September of 2019, I got a text message from um, some friends of ours, ours, Brian and Amanda Montgomery. Some of you guys know them. And uh, they, they were talking about a season of life that they were in and some things that they were going through. They had just gotten a new house, and they were basically wanting to consecrate their house uh, with a night of worship. And the season they were going through was kind of a tough one. There was a lot of changes going on, a lot of things that, that, the, earth, that the Lord was unearthing in them uh, as far as wanting to heal some stuff in and, and their past and different things like that. And so they decided to have a public worship night at their house. Well, I guess it was more of a private one because it was by invitation only. But they had this worship night at their house, and he asked me to lead worship at it. He invited Bailey and I out there and he asked me to lead worship. But specifically, he asked me to write a song that prophesied over their season. So it's September of 2019, and that is when I sat down and I started having a conversation with the Lord, asking him about what they were going through, what was going on in their lives, and he gave me the song that we sing here called These Wells Go Deep. Um, you may not know it by the title, but there's a line in it that says, heaven soaked this soil with joy and oil and planted seeds for heaven's dreams. Um, That song's a year and a half old now. Um, At the time that I wrote it, I came back after we had that worship night at their house and we did it here, and it went pretty well. Um, Sometimes when you you introduce a new song, sometimes it goes like this. Uh, Sometimes it goes like this. Uh, those are the really blessed times, but sometimes it goes like this. It felt like this was one of those times, you know, early on, when af- right after I wrote it, um, because the lyrics in it are actually, they're pretty deep. You have to really think about what you're singing. Um, and I actually like to write songs like that so that you're forced to think about it, because I don't want us to ever come in here and just sing words just because there are words up there and we're just reciting words. We need to be thinking about the things that we're singing and the, the, the sacrifice of praise that we're giving to the Lord. Um, this specific song, we did it here a few times after I wrote it, and it kind of went like that every time. It was powerful, um, but you could tell it wasn't really hitting us completely. Then my wife, several months later, gets up and leads it, And that day after service, I had three or four people text me and say, is that a new song? (laughs) I said, no, it just sounds better when my wife does it. Uh, At that point, you know, we we had done it here before. And and since then, you know, we've done it occasionally. But here lately, it's been what I believe is like kind of the song of the hour, what God is speaking to us right now. And there's always been a line in this song that we tend to repeat, that we tend to go back to, and that we tend to reference, and that's heaven soaked this soil with joy and oil and planted seeds for heaven's dreams. That sounds like a poem, but there's deep meaning in that. And and this morning, because this is what I believe the Lord is speaking to us today in this season, I wanna unpack that prophetic statement, that prophetic declaration that we sing and what the Word says about it, and what I believe God is saying to us in that declaration. A few weeks ago, we did this song, and there was a lot of prophetic um, moments that day, if you guys don't remember. Uh, But one of the things in particular, there was a prophetic word released about the seeds of generations, 
uh, finally cracking open and bearing fruit. Uh, the seeds of generations past, things that generations have prayed, things that they've sung, things that they've released. It's time, finally time for these seeds to bear fruit. Um, and it's past time, like it's, this is past due. And Pastor April shared either last week or the week before about how that prophetic declaration, she felt like it was for Tucson, Arizona. She has family up there and they've been going through some stuff over the years and they've, uh, she felt like this word was for them. I believe that it was. But I also believe that it was for us. It was released in this house, and I want to unpack it, okay? So heaven soaked this soil with joy and oil and planted seeds for heaven's dreams. I want to talk first about the purpose of soil and seeds, what happens with soil and seeds in the natural, okay? You sow seeds in the soil, and the, what soil does for a seed is, first of all, it becomes a foothold for the roots of the plant, when the seed finally cracks open and begins, the plant begins to sprout out of it, the roots go down into the soil. We sang it this morning. They are grounded in the soil. The purpose of the soil with the roots, for one of the purposes, is to keep that plant in one place so that when the wind comes, when the, uh, the rain, the storms come, that plant won't just get uprooted and knocked out. These roots actually keep it in one place, okay? Keep it from being shaken, keep it from being moved, right? But the other purpose of soil is that it gives the plants nutrients. It feeds the roots. Now, soil can feed roots as long as it's watered. The purpose of watering a plant, you guys think, you know, a plant's just thirsty, like the leaves are gonna soak up the water. That's not the purpose of water whenever you're watering a plant. What happens when you water a plant is actually the water goes through the soil and pulls all the nutrients out of the soil and then transfers it to the roots. So the water becomes kind of a bridge between the seed and the soil. The water connects them. You don't have that water there. There's nothing to grab hold of what's in the soil and feed the plant with. There's nothing to connect the two things. So water is a bridge. Everybody say water is the bridge. It's not water under the bridge. It is the bridge. Shannon, write that one down. Um, <laughs> she always writes down my, she's writing it down. <laughs> she always writes down my dad jokes. So this is what happens with soil and seeds in the natural. So whenever we're singing, heaven soaked this soil with joy and oil and planted seeds for heaven's dreams, I want to talk about what this means. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. By the way, you know how I'm always talking about how I wish I had a fluffy message for you? It finally happened. <laughs> John didn't want to be challenged this morning. <laughs> Matthew chapter 13. I want to start with verse 1. It says, That day Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea, and large crowds gathered to him. So he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole crowd was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on the rocky places, where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up, because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. Others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears, let him hear. Now I want to skip down to verse 18, um, and in verse 18 he begins to explain what that parable means. Verse 18 starts with, hear then the parable of the sower. Remember he said, he who has ears, let him hear. So now in verse 18 he's saying, hear this. He's about to explain what this parable means. Verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. The one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, this is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. 
Yet he has no firm root in himself, but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. There's an explanation here what I believe that the Lord has been speaking to us in this prophetic declaration we've been making. Heaven soaked this soil with joy and oil and planted seeds for heaven's dreams. If you look at verse 19, in one verse Jesus describes and he explains what the soil is and what the seed is. And I believe this this pertains to the prophetic declaration we've been making. If you're wondering what the seeds are and the soil is in this declaration we've been making, I'm about to tell you. Jesus explains what the soil is and what the seed is in verse 19. He says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. What has been sown in his heart. This tells us that the heart is the soil. Okay? The soil is where you sow the seed, right? So the heart is the soil. Well, what's the seed? Verse 19, the beginning, it says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom. This is the seed, the word of the kingdom. The heart is the soil, and the seed is the word of the kingdom. What's the word of the kingdom? It's the gospel. It's Jesus. Jesus, the gospel, is the word of the kingdom. This says, when anyone hears the gospel and doesn't understand the gospel, the enemy comes and snatches away that seed. The enemy comes and takes it away. And we know, listen, the other thing we know is this. It says at the end or toward the end of verse 19, the enemy snatches away what has been sown in his heart. What has been sown in his heart. What this is saying, some of you, I can see the confused looks. What this is saying is that all it takes for the seed of the gospel to be sown into you is hearing it. It says when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, you don't have to understand the gospel for the the seed of the gospel to be sown into you. So this morning, even when I say, hey, guess what? Jesus Christ died for your sins and after three days resurrected and ascended back to the Father and now he's your intercessor and your mediator and if you receive him, you receive everything he died for. I just preached the gospel to you and just by hearing it, that seed was sown into your heart. Now, everyone in here is soil. Every single person in here is soil. And as I said that and you heard it, the seed of the gospel was sown into you. The word says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. This is what it's saying. Immediately upon hearing it, this seed is sown. But hearing the gospel is not enough. Because what this says is that anyone who hears it and doesn't understand it will lose it. It's not enough to just hear the gospel. In other words, it's not enough for me to go to the next college campus down the road and just preach the gospel, planting the seed, and expect something to be done with it. The people who hear it need to understand it. Now, you might be thinking, well, I understand the gospel. I get it. I know what it means. But this word understand actually doesn't mean to just know about It doesn't mean to just perceive it or to be aware of it. This word understand literally means to allow what you perceive to change your perception. To allow what you are aware of to change your awareness. To allow what you have seen to change the way that you see. 
See, I can hear the gospel preached, but I only understand it when I allow it to impact the way that I see the world around me. You know, maybe I've seen Jesus die for me. I've seen him die for me. I've seen his sacrifice, and I've seen what he can do for me. But it's not enough to just see it. I have to let what I've seen change the way I see. This is what it means to understand the gospel. Changing the way that I think about everything. I can't just know it in my brain. I have to let my brain change. I have to allow it to change. The way that I think and see everything, my perception, the way that I understand the world around me filters through the lens of the gospel. This is what it means to understand it. Now that's a journey. And that can be a challenge in and of itself. He even says in this parable, the one on whom the seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the person who hears the gospel and receives it, but the moment anything troublesome comes, they fall away. How many believers are there like that in the world? That these, it's, it's kind of a, a modern day belief now to avoid persecution to avoid resistance when it doesn't make sense because the word clearly says resist the devil. If there is a resisting of the devil, there you are going to experience some resistance. It's not enough for us to just have the seed planted in our heart. So what happens when we begin to understand the gospel is that I see all of my circumstances, negative and positive, through the lens of the sacrifice of Jesus. I see all of the trials and the troubles and the tribulation and the persecution that I go through through the lens of of the sacrifice of Jesus and everything he has given to me. I see my poverty through the sacrifice of Jesus. If I see my poverty for what it is, I see poverty, but through the lens of the sacrifice of Jesus, I see that I am prosperous despite my, my lack of materials on this earth. Does this make sense? So this means, understanding the gospel means that because of what I know about Jesus, I now think differently about everything. Now in reading his explanation here and talking about the different types of soil and the different places, I think sometimes we read this as meaning that different people, that we're all different kinds of soil, that we're all going to receive the gospel differently. I, I actually don't think that's right. I think everybody is good enough soil for the gospel. I think that it's what you do with the gospel that determines what kind of soil you are. This is what this, this parable is saying. It's not that, well, you don't, don't, don't bother preaching to him. Some of us in here may be like, don't bother preaching to Joe Biden. He's rocky soil. It's what you do with the gospel that determines what kind of soil you are. Jesus has made it so. Everyone within ear of the gospel is good enough soil to receive it if they want it. You hear me? So how do we understand the gospel? How do we allow the gospel to bear fruit in our lives? Because what this says, if you read in the, in the last verse, in verse 23, and the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit. It's not enough for me to just plant a seed if it doesn't grow. There's no point in planting a seed if it doesn't grow and eventually bear fruit, Right? If it doesn't eventually, what I plant beneath the soil needs to show itself above the soil in order for the sowing to be worth it, for it to mean something, right? So what we need is for the seed of the gospel to bear fruit in our lives. And what verse 23 says is that the seed of the gospel bears fruit in our lives when we not only hear it, but we also understand it. You following me? So how do we understand the gospel? What's the link there? What, how do we allow the gospel to bear fruit in our lives? Because, you know, saying, saying you should allow the gospel to change the way you think is easy enough, but actually putting that into practice is a whole different thing. 
Allowing the gospel to change the way that I think is a whole different thing than just saying that's what I should do, okay? It's easier to say it than it is to do it, right? So how do we allow it to bear fruit in our lives? If our heart is the soil and the gospel is the seed, if our heart is the soil and the gospel is the seed, something has to connect our heart to the gospel. What would you say, John? Water. When I water, you're getting ahead of me, Phyllis. <laughs> when I water a seed, when I water soil, it carries the nutrients from the soil into the seed. It connects the soil to the seed. The water is the bridge, the pathway from the soil to the seed. Now, I'm not necessarily talking about God sprinkling water on us. And some of us got sprinkled on today when we came in, Okay. This isn't what I'm talking about. But the prophetic statement that we've been declaring says, heaven soaked this soil with joy and oil. This isn't just a pretty statement. This is biblical. What we are saying when we declare this is from the Bible. He soaked this soil. This means that the seed that God has planted in this soil is watered with joy and oil. He's using joy and oil to bridge the gap, to connect the seed to the soil, to connect what he has sown to us. He uses joy and oil. So if that's the case, then there's something about joy and oil that brings an understanding of the gospel because this ultimately will lead to that seed bearing fruit in our lives. Everyone following me still? Okay. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter 1. I just want to say that the interns in David's tent are incredible. They're just incredible people. And yesterday we had a little time of reflection and, and they were just talking about the things they've been impacted by. Most of them, well, pretty much all of them said the biggest thing is, I can hear God. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's like the answer to every single problem you will ever face. So we're good. Maybe we should just stop at six weeks. No, it's, it's, they're so... Uh, Awesome. It's so awesome to see them just being impacted. Even when we're talking, you'll see them, like their eyes get really big when God like drops a revelation into them. They're like, oh my gosh. Like we have to take a moment, brain explosion. <laughs> Let's look at Hebrews chapter one. And I want to start with verse eight here. This says, but of the son, he says, he meaning the father. But of the Son, the Father says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your companions. This is actually a direct quote from Psalm 45. You can look at it if you want to. But it's a direct quote from Psalm 45. And the reason I'm not using Psalm 45 and instead I'm using the place where it's quoted is because in Psalm 45, it doesn't say that the Father is saying that to the Son. And I wanted to emphasize this or about the Son. In Psalm 45, it's actually a, a picture of a wedding feast. And if you wanna read it, like I said, you can. But in here, in Hebrews chapter one, it says the Father says that Jesus has been anointed with the oil of gladness. The Father says that Jesus has been anointed with the oil of gladness, and it was because of his love for righteousness and his hatred for lawlessness. It was because of his pursuit of holiness, living a holy life. It was because of his pursuit of righteousness and his hatred for anything that was not of God, that God then, the Father then, anointed him with the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness here isn't actually a metaphor for anything. It's a real thing. 
I don't know if you know much about Jewish culture, but in Jewish culture, the oil of gladness was an oil that they would pour over people during feasts and festivals and weddings. And if you got the oil of gladness poured on you, it mean that you had reason to celebrate. So to anoint someone, which typically they pour it over the head, to anoint someone with the oil of gladness means, hey, you have cause to celebrate. And they would do this at feasts. And believe it or not, this is actually the same oil that David refers to in Psalm 23 whenever he says, you anointed my head with oil. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Everyone knows that one, right? You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. David is talking about a feast. He's talking about a festival. And he says, you've anointed my head with the oil of gladness. Well, remember what I said in Jewish culture, if you got anointed with the oil of gladness, it, mean that you had, it meant that you had cause to celebrate, right? But what's interesting is David says in Psalm 23 that he was being anointed with oil at a table in front of his enemies. He had cause to celebrate when his enemies were there staring at him. He didn't have cause to celebrate after the battle was done. He had cause to celebrate when his enemies were staring at him. Now, how intimidating do you think this would be? Most of us like to intimidate the enemy probably by yelling and snarling and spitting and getting angry at the enemy. Get out of here, devil, right? But David is like, yay, God. He's getting the oil of gladness poured on him. He has reason to celebrate. He's not even fighting a battle. He's just sitting down at a table enjoying a feast with Jesus right there in front of his enemies. How intimidating, how much more intimidating is it than yelling and snarling and spitting and getting angry? How much more intimidating would it be to your enemy to just celebrate in front of him? That would be so confusing for him, right? Because believe it or not, when the enemy approaches you and he's on the attack, he wants you to yell and snarl and spit. He wants you to get all up in his face. He's taunting you as just as Goliath did. He's taunting you. He's exposing himself. He's saying, come out here and fight me like a man, David. When moments before, David's probably just in the pasture worshiping Jesus celebrating God. But the enemy, many times, he wants you to get into his face and spit at him and yell at him because it means you're looking at him. As long as I can get them looking at me, I feel like I've already won. But instead, you decide, no, I've been anointed with the oil of gladness. You know what I'm gonna do? I have reason to celebrate. I'm gonna celebrate right now, and then the enemy's like, hold on just a minute. This isn't right. We're supposed to fight a battle here. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's some revelation here that I really want you to get. Now, David, <laughs> he doesn't even, in this psalm, doesn't even talk about battling anyone. He doesn't talk about battling his enemies. He's basically saying, I'm going to celebrate and you're going to watch. You know, I always say it's rude to eat in front of somebody. Not in front of the enemy. It's not rude to eat in front of the enemy. It's proper. He doesn't want to watch you sit. He didn't want to sit there and watch you eat and celebrate and feast while, he, while he's in trying to intimidate you and threatening you. He doesn't want that. And I promise you, you'd be so caught off guard if you just decided, I'm just going to celebrate right now. The oil of gladness here in Hebrews chapter one, verse nine, the word gladness means extreme joy. Literally, extreme joy. I don't, what does that even look like? Many of us have felt joy. Have you ever felt extreme joy? Joy that is so intense you can't keep it inside? The joy that you're gonna feel when you have a slice of that cake today? <laughs> extreme joy. 
How intimidating would it be for me to have extreme joy in front of the enemy? Man, that would scare him off so quick. I promise you, that would scare him off quicker than anything to just praise and celebrate in front of him. Now, this scripture is in reference to Jesus, Hebrews 1. The Father is saying of Jesus, you've been anointed with the oil of gladness. Now, this isn't actually saying that Jesus was anointed with oil. This isn't saying literally that someone came and poured the oil of gladness on him or that the Father did. This is just telling us that he was anointed by something. If you read in Acts chapter 10, 38, 10 verse 38, you don't have to turn there, but I'll read it to you. It says, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God the Father anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit. This was his anointing. And it says here in Hebrews 1.9 that the Holy Spirit is the oil of gladness. The Holy Spirit is joy and oil. Why does it refer to the Holy Spirit as the oil of gladness here? Well, don't you think after everything that he did, Jesus had every reason to celebrate Don't you think that after everything he went through and everything he accomplished, he had more than enough cause to celebrate, to be glad, to have extreme joy? Pastor Cliff and I have talked about this before. We believe God has emotions, but we don't believe he's emotional. I believe Jesus gets sad, but I don't believe that he is sad. I believe his demeanor is one of extreme joy, always. And his heart is one of extreme joy. And the word says he's been anointed by the Holy Spirit. He's been anointed by joy and oil. The oil of gladness has been poured onto Jesus. And you might think, what does this have to do with me? Listen, when you receive Jesus, you become part of his body. And when oil is poured on the head, guess what, it's eventually gonna hit the body. You better believe it, that this Holy Spirit that came in power on the day of Pentecost, whenever it fell, that that Holy Spirit had been poured onto Jesus and all of that oil, all of that spirit, all the fullness of the presence of God then descended upon mankind as it literally ran down the beard of Jesus and began to touch the body of Christ. That, that because Jesus has been anointed by the Holy Spirit, because he has been anointed by the oil of gladness and he has cause to celebrate, it has now hit you and you have cause to celebrate. You have been anointed by the oil of gladness. Some of us are walking around soaked in gladness, but we look sad. Let me tell you something about oil too. That's hard to get out. Ask my forehead. <laughs> I was leaning up against a chair the other day and I leaned back and there's just greasy, oily print on the chair. <laughs> Blame my dad for that one. Oil, oily faces running the family, but oil is hard to get out. Once you've been hit by the Holy Spirit, don't expect to get that one out. That's going to be there for a really long time, especially you've been soaked in it. And the word that we've been declaring says God has soaked you with joy and oil. He has soaked you. It wasn't just a little dribble. It wasn't just a drop. He has soaked you with joy, joy and oil. So what does that mean for us when it comes to understanding the gospel? Because earlier I'm talking about, you know, you can sow the seed of the gospel into a person's heart, but they have to understand it in order for it to bear fruit. Well, the Holy Spirit is, our, is the connection between the soil and the seed. The Holy Spirit, the joy and oil, the oil of gladness is a connection between you and the gospel. How does this even work? You got to think about it this way with David. 
David's sitting at a table in, on a battlefield in front of his enemies, and the oil of gladness has been poured over him. He has begun to celebrate. How do you understand the gospel? What does this mean to understand the gospel, to bear the fruit of the gospel? This is what it looks like. Understanding that you don't win your battles on the battlefield, you win it at the table. That my fight with the enemy is not fought sword on sword. He just gets to look at me while I enjoy what Jesus has given me. While I rest in my security and in my identity, I fight a battle just by sitting down and eating with Jesus. This is me understanding the gospel. That I have nothing to fear, I have nothing to be hopeless about, I have nothing to run away from. My enemies are so scared of me because I realize I'm just sitting here with the Jesus Christ, the the Jesus who saved me and has given me everything. He is he's provided for every need. This is me understanding the gospel. How does the Holy Spirit help me understand it? That's how. I'm glad, I'm joyful. The joy and oil that covers me has made the gospel bear fruit in my life. And I realize that my identity and my battle is not won on the battlefield, it is won at the table. I'm telling you, when you realize where you are seated, every battle you ever face will cease. Every batter you ever, you, you ever would have faced will just be quenched. Can you imagine? Because many times when we approach the enemy with anger and, you know, we're just like fighting back. I'm not saying spiritual warfare is not a thing, but I'm telling you there's a form of spiritual warfare that I think outdoes every other form, and that's just sitting down. Resting in your identity, understanding who you are, what, what you have been given. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So what affects you down here can only affect you for a little bit. I was teaching this to, to David's tent yesterday. We were talking about intercession and how Jesus is our intercessor because he was both fully God and fully man. And as Pastor April intimated last week, he had one foot in heaven, one foot on the earth. He was fully God and fully man. Now you and I, the word says, not we will be seated with Christ in heavenly places, it says we are. And although we are not God, because of who we are and what we have received that is in Jesus Christ and the fact that we are seated with Christ in heavenly places, we now have one foot in heaven and one foot on the earth. That as we live our lives, we literally walk and live in two dimensions. And guess which one is eternal? Guess which one has more power? And this is the other thing. When you worship God, when you truly worship him and give him the sacrifice of praise, he will begin to reveal to you who you are. The cause to celebrate happened before the battle began. I have a reason to celebrate before I fight, not after. The victory happens before the battle in the heaven, in, in the kingdom of God. It doesn't happen after. This is how it works with us. If you worship Jesus and truly give him everything and spend time with him in praise, you know what's going to happen? The word says that we enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Well, what is in his courts? He is. Where are we? With him. When you enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, as you enter into the courts of the king, guess what you're going to see? You're going to see Jesus and you. This is the power of praise, of celebration. I have reason to celebrate because devil, you know where I'm at right now? Far from you. And my fight with you is already won because of what Jesus has done. Amen. Let's stand. 
Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.